Welcome to the second part of this session where we are talking about what makes cities life-sized. And our next speaker knows because um, he made a whole series of documentaries about the subject under the title The Life-Sized City. Michael Colville Anderson. Hi. Hi, uh, Michael. How are you? Good, thank you. Happy uh, here. Yeah, in your documentaries, you visited cities all over the world. Um, Bangkok, New Orleans, Barcelona, Beirut, many more. How do you decide which cities to visit? Well, I mean, the research team behind the series, uh, they do a lot of hard work. <laughs> and uh, they, they try to figure out where cool stuff is happening. Luckily, it's not hard. In every city around the world, cool stuff is happening. But we really look at, at cities with a geographical spread, but also where the citizens really, you know, and some policymakers, not that many, unfortunately, are, are really taking matters into their own hands, really trying to make their cities better. So it's yeah. really, it's up to the projects in the cities. Uh, this festival is about innovation. When you talk about cool stuff, is that implicitly innovation? No, not at all. It is just people who look at the street in front of their home saying, this sucks. Why do we need parking there? Our kids don't have any safe place to play. We don't have any trees on our street. We should have some urban farming, you know, like, and nobody's doing this for us. So we're going to go out into our neighborhood, the sense of ownership, and we're just going to do it ourselves. That's cool stuff. All right. Um, you live in Copenhagen, which looks quite life-sized to me. Um, why did you move to Copenhagen? I mean, I'm Danish. Uh, I grew up in, in, in Canada, uh, immigrants uh, back in the day. But, um, you know, I've lived there for 25 years. And uh, for me, it's just a place where I feel at home. And uh, there's more, more, I guess, roots than anything else. But living there now for 25 years, yeah, it's not a bad place to live when you, when you travel around the world as I do and see other stuff, right? You know, it's kind of, everything's, everything kind of works. Mm. But then on the other hand, I like cities where stuff is broken and you have to rise up and, and do it yourself. And you see a lot more citizen uh, engagement in cities where stuff is broken where you know copenhagen we're just like mm, it's so danish design and, and glossy right <laughs> yeah, so yeah. there's that and cycling and cycling of course yeah, yeah. Yeah. looking forward to your talk thank you very much all right thank you very much i mean it's uh I think if anybody can comment on uh, the life-size city and what makes cities life-sized, it might actually be me, right? Because I have this global documentary series where I travel around the world and I meet these people in cities around the world who are trying to make their neighborhoods, their cities better. It is a constant source of inspiration to me. Um, but it is just a title, and a title comes from an idea, and like everything else, ideas come from somewhere. So if I'm going to talk about the life-size city, I have to go backwards a little bit in time, back to this kid. This is my daughter, Lulu Sophia. Yeah, she's a big, awkward teenager now, but back in the day, when she was four and a half years old, we were walking around our neighborhood in Copenhagen, holding hands, waiting to cross the street at an intersection. And she was kind of quiet at that time. She's pensive, not saying so much, just looking around. And then, out of the blue, she turns to me, looks up, and says, Daddy, when is my city going to fit me? When is my city going to fit me? Like this desperate voice. And, you know, she had been looking around her urban theater and thinking, oh, damn, I'm small. This place was not made for me. This place was made for giants. And I said, oh, girl, I get it. You know, you're small, but you're going to grow. You're going to get bigger. It's going to be okay. You're going to catch up. And you know, she just kind of looked at me and just thought like, yeah, I know, but damn, I feel small. And this kid from the age of three and a half, <laughs> three and a half had been delivering line after line of urbanist you know, wisdom, blurting out observations about our city and our neighborhood that just blew me away every time. So many that I have a notebook filled with the stuff she said. I've called her the world's youngest urbanist. But I knew on that street corner that day <laughs> in Copenhagen that this, this might be next level. What happened was this, the next few weeks, I became completely obsessed by her simple observation, wondering, does my city fit me, Michael, you know, riding my bike around Copenhagen, going about my daily life, but then stopping up on a street, thinking, does, does the city fit me here? Huh, yeah, wow, but why? What makes it work here? Or another place in the city, ooh, not so much here, why not? What doesn't work here? Observing, analyzing, looking for patterns. And I realized back then that this was next level and that I had to call it something. I had to you know, honor it with a name, honor Lulu Sophia's observation, so I ended up calling it the Life Size City. And the Life Size City for me is a place where everybody who lives in the city feels like the city fits them, like a glove. 
it is the backbone of my thinking in urbanism. It is a valuable tool that I use in my work in urban design. And we have some other tools, man. In Scandinavia, we talk a lot about democratic design, how we should design our cities, you know, for the kids like Ludo Sophia, the disabled, the elderly, and not just this group in the middle that most cities in the world are focused on, the people with money who can buy stuff and keep the economy rolling. So we have some cool stuff in Scandinavia, but, you know, it is still, like everywhere else, a lot of talk. Now, my urban thinking over the past decade has strangely led me backwards in time, backwards to this 7,000 years since we started living together in cities. And it really is a fascinating journey. There are so many ideas that we had back in the day that can be transferred into our cities today. You know, and, and a lot of them are forgotten. So I'm kind of on an archeological dig constantly looking for these ideas about, about how we can transfer them. But for 7,000 years, the streets of our cities were the most democratic spaces in the history of Homo sapiens. Nothing beat the streets for democracy. We did everything in the streets. They were extensions of our homes. They were, they were our, our, our living rooms. And this was the prevailing perception of streets in every city on the planet for seven millennia. Everywhere in the world, cities made by cultures that didn't even know each other existed. The Aztecs, the, the Incas, cities in Asia, Africa, Middle East, North America, Europe. Everybody had it all figured out. They made incredibly life-sized cities uh, for 7,000 years. But they looked at the streets and the, the markets and the, the plazas and they went, yeah, that's ours. That's totally ours. Something happened to change that, something drastic. And it really still is the elephant in the room that nobody dares talk about. We invented the automobile, and we tried to pump as many as possible into our cities and towns. And it started really 100 years ago in the 1920s or so, and, you know, nothing has, good has really come of this. Everything changed almost overnight. Everything we knew, everything we had practiced, we had learned about cities for 7,000 years, you just washed away under the carpet of asphalt. This was the greatest paradigm shift in the history of our cities. Nothing before, nothing after has had such an all dominating effect on the way that we think about cities. The other elephant in the room, it's kind of, it's kind of a baby elephant. It's still kind of cute, you know, but it, it's tech. Now there's nothing wrong with tech or technological advances in our modern age, but what I see as a problem is all over the world, this, this seemingly pornographic obsession with tech. You know, like, oh, tech, man, it's awesome. What is it? I don't know what it is, but it's just tech. Every time a Silicon Valley bro says, yeah, man, tech is going to save the world, dude. Everybody's going, oh, cool. What does it mean? We don't know. You know, we, I've never seen any large scale application of tech really transforming cities for the better. It's a dangerous obsession. Well, you know, I follow Elon Musk on Twitter. I don't know why, but I still do. But yeah, the age of urbanism, this is what I call it. This is where we are right now. And I don't know how we got here because something happened along the way. And I've spent years looking for the catalyst, you know, maybe an article, a blog post somewhere that started this global movement. Can't find it because this is a collective movement all over the world. Citizens in neighborhoods in every city on the planet have just all of a sudden stood up in their collective subconscious. They're saying, yeah, okay, uh, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work here and I have ideas to make it better. I want to be heard. I want my voice back because we have forgotten these people. We have not listened to them in 100 years of car-centric urban planning and the people want their fingerprints on their streets and their neighborhoods and their cities at large. And it's everywhere that I go. In a little neighborhood on, in the suburbs of Buenos Aires, in the heart of Tokyo, Toronto, Tel Aviv, Paris, everywhere, the citizens are rising up and demanding the change that they need and that they deserve. This is an example of where we're going because we're going somewhere new and exciting. This is, these are the three photos. One location, Copenhagen, 1907. Democratic space, democratic streets, life-size streets. 1972 in the middle, yeah, we made the same mistakes as everybody else. We paved over paradise and just, you know, let in the cars, pumped them into our city. But that's what the street looks like now in Copenhagen. Democratic space, life-sized street. For all the talk of Copenhagen as an urbanist benchmark city, it's important to remember that Copenhagen wasn't always Copenhagen. You know, we, uh, we made the same mistakes as everybody else. Uh, there's a square in the medieval city center. On the right, that photo was taken in the year I was born. Parking. And then what it looks like today. Beautiful human public space. But we're going somewhere new. And you know where that is? We're going back to the future. This is what I see happening all over the world. We're going back to a time when we were rational and intelligent about urban planning, a time before the automobile came along and messed up all of our thinking about cities. We're going back to the future. 
So what does it take for us to go back to the future, to reestablish our life-size cities? I have a little list here. First of all, we need design. And design is absolutely imperative for us. I have design friends who say, yeah, dude, design's going to save the world. There are t-shirts, you know, it's not true. But design thinking is integral in the way that we think about our cities because design is a human to human process. You know, the people, the design teams, wherever they are in the world that made the smartphones that you all have, your toothbrush, your refrigerator, you know, this clicker that I'm using on stage, they were focused on one thing, and that was the human at the other end. That the, you know, at looking down the design process tunnel, there was a human, and they're just hoping that they could give me a good design experience, a user experience with this clicker today, with all the products that we have. Human to human uh, process, man. Engineering and urban planning, you know, a lot of it, it's not human to human at all. It's maps. It's mathematical models, many from the 60s. We still use them today with transport in cities. It's super bizarre. It's like the planners and the engineers on their pedestals that they made for themselves looking out across the city, you know, from a helicopter view, you know, looking at a city as a thing, a, a construct that needs to be engineered. We have to engineer a city. We will dictate what happens on your street there because here on the map, 10 kilometers away, that makes a lot of sense to us. It's not human to human at all. We need to focus on design. You know, what if we just designed our streets and our neighborhoods like we design every other product that we own, like we expect every product that we own to be designed? You think like that, and you're going to go to a different, more beautiful place. The other thing that we need is, quite simply, simplicity. We need to remember that, you know, humans are rational. And cities, for 7,000 years, they were complex, absolutely, but the design of them, the planning of them, was a much more simple process. Not this massive overcomplication that we see in our modern world with planning and, and engineering and a, this tech obsession that we have. It was a simple process. We need to go back to that. This guy had it all figured out. <laughs> English monk, William of Ockham, 13th century. The, the principle of Occam's razor is attributed to him. And quite simply, as you'd expect, it just means that of all the ideas on the table in front of you, you know what? The simplest one is probably going to be the best idea. And if it's not simple enough, you take Occam's razor, <laughs> slice it up, and you're left with something simple, beautiful, functional, and useful. Simplicity is the absolute key. We also have to change the question. We've just been asking the same damn questions in our cities for decades, getting the same tired answers, and oh, I guess that's that, okay. You know, we have to change the question. Regarding transport in cities, this question needs to be changed very quickly. We've only asked one question of our traffic engineers all over the world for the better part of 70 years. And that question is simply, hey dude, because they're all dudes, <laughs> how many cars can we fit down this street? How many cars? That's it. That's what the question is, you know, we know that there's no answer to this. We know that if, you know, if you, you know, think of the hundreds and hundreds of billions of euros we've spent on traffic and traffic engineering over the past 100 years, and we have nothing to show for it. The only thing that we know is that if you make more space for cars, if you widen a road, put an extra lane on that motorway, add some parking, you end up with more cars than you started with. You didn't ease any congestion at all. It's called induced demand. This is the only thing that we know to be true regarding traffic in cities. The cool cities around the world, man, the cool kids, they're asking a totally different question. Actually, they're just changing one word in this question. They're now asking, hey, how many people can we move down a street? How many people? Humans, right? Using all the cool stuff that we've invented, trams, buses, bus lanes, bicycles, oh my God, bicycles, of course, wider sidewalks for pedestrian volume, trains to connect things a little, a little bit better on the urban landscape. How many people? The model that I made here in Photoshop pretty quickly, it still has 10 times the capacity for moving people down a street than the model at the top that we just all copy-pasted from the Americans, duh, in the 1950s without thinking. Change the questions, man. The last thing we need is a hard and immediate transfer of power from the engineers and the planners and, oh my God, the politicians in their tower looking out across the city as this thing to be engineered to the absolute experts in our cities, the people who know better what needs to be done in every city in the world, the citizens. Whatever street you live on, you are the world's leading expert about that street and the neighborhood that you spend your time in, together with your neighbors. Nobody knows better than you. Nobody in an office 10 kilometers away has any idea about the details of what works, doesn't work, what could be better on your street. I see it all over the world. The citizens are rising up, meeting neighbors, not even urbanists, just regular people are taking the streets back. 
taking matters into their own hands. Cool neighborhoods in modern cities, the poorest neighborhoods on the planet, the people have the answers. If you dare ask them, we have to stop dictating and we have to start listening to the experts. That is the future. That is where we need to go. These are the four things that I think we need to start our journey back to the future to reestablish our life-size cities in this, the age of urbanism. Thank you. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're the only audience member here, so that means a lot to me. <laughs> yeah, I can clap too if you want. Uh, no, no, I like that you put the residents in the center of your thoughts. Yeah, and, and also in the center of your documentaries. It's, it's, a, it's so, something everyone seems to forget. I mean, when we started the documentary and I developed the idea and we're planning it, we thought, oh, we're going to talk to some politicians in each city, some, some of my colleagues, planners and architects, and maybe some citizens. The citizens have hijacked the entire series. We're, we're in the middle of season four filming now, right? Uh, you guys see it here in Belgium. I mean, it's the citizens. Like, it's just like they just do the coolest stuff and they, they're the ones who are inspiring to me. So I have learned that my colleagues are maybe not as interesting anymore. The people, <laughs> the regular citizens, yeah. man, that's the future of cities as they were the past. You're in Leuven, uh, which we are very, very grateful for. You You've walked around. How does Leve speak to you as a city? I mean, the cities in this region, they're, they're, they're always kind of cool, right? I mean, you know, you walk down the busy street here, it's not even busy. <laughs> I just said it was probably busy in the 70s. You made the same mistakes as we did too, right? But yeah, you know, you just sort of, the cars are second class citizens here, the motorists, which is how it should be, you know? Yeah, that's, all, um, that's only recent indeed. Yeah. yeah, the last I mean, 10 years, perhaps, yeah. I think it's cool. You know, I, you know, you walk around, you see kids just riding their bikes to school, talking on their bikes, you know, hey, what's up? You know, like, that, that's, an, that's an indicator, right? When the kids and the parents who are the, ooh, parents are scared. You know, I mean, when the kids are just riding around here uh, off their school on their bikes, man, it's, it's a very nice, very life-size place. All right. We've got some questions from audience members. Um, first one is uh, Michael Klut, of Michael Klut. Hey. Yes, hey. thank you. Hey, Michael, nice name. Um, I would like to know, I would like to take us out of the city again, actually, uh, with this question, um, with all of these cities becoming more and more uh, sustainably optimized, they also tend to become a bit more exclusively um, and not in reach for a lot of people. Um, so actually, what role can a rural, more village size living environments play um, besides these cities? And should we maybe uh, start thinking more urgently of life-sized villages Uh, spreading also this living quality we're looking for um, outside of cities and also diminishing maybe this urban consumerism concentration um, which cities tend to become. I mean, absolutely. We see a lot more focus now on, uh, on you know, developers have a voice now, right? And this, this financial thing, oh, we're going to develop the city, we're going to build stuff, and the politicians are going, oh my God, cool. You know, oh, the materials are cheaper now, so build super cheap stuff, lots of houses, but I mean, I, certainly in Copenhagen, this is our problem. Like, we have mm -hmm. uh, an incredible focus on, uh, on just building stuff for people with money. You know, we don't, we have laws about affordable housing, 25%, but we're not really doing that. So I think, you know, I mean, people People, there will be, always be people who want to live in small towns, and I think, by and large, a lot of small towns have everything they need to be life-sized, right? It's kind of like what they are, by, you know, unless you have too many cars blowing through at 50 kilometers per hour, you know. But, I mean, so I think cities, you know, I, 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 all the time I hear people say, oh, I'm, you work with big cities. You know, I live in a small town, so everything you say doesn't mean anything to me, and vice versa. Oh, a small town? No, I live in a big city, you know. But, man, every neighborhood, I live in a, I live in a village. I live in a neighborhood with 11,000 people per square kilometer in, in the heart of Copenhagen. Like I say, I, I, you know, I know my local shops. So, I mean, we all, cities are just villages connected by, you know, by transport, you know? So I think there's a lot of inspiration in the, in the small town concept because we forget that in a city, we're just living in a bunch of small towns together, you know? I don't go to that neighborhood in, in Copenhagen because like, no, that's not my neighborhood, you know? I, this is my village. I go to my local wine bar in my hood, you know? Um, so I think it's, there, there is, we should remember that there is a lot of crossover, a lot of cross pollination nation between the two it's not two different animals as i feel a lot of people think there is but yeah affordable housing and you know taking the power away from not just the planners and the engineers and the politicians but also the developers like i always forget to mention them and they they also need to you know have their nipples a bit. Mm -hmm. they're the yeah. worst man yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you michael, for your Thanks, michael thank you thank you for the answer next question is from stum hi stum Hey, Michael. Hello. Thank you for your uh, talk. I had a little question concerning about uh, a bit more technology-wise. Uh, it was about 
uh, Goat Spaces, James Rydell, uh, British uh, author. He wrote about Goat Spaces with an example of a Goat Space stating the airport. It is actually a Goat Space, or at least a space where the um, when the goat falls away, uh, space becomes like a huge hall of frustrated passengers. I was wondering, like, the link between the goat and the space or at least the physical and the digital environment, how it would fly on the uh, life-size city. Now, did you say goat? Code. code. No, no, code. Because, <laughs> yeah. okay, I'm thinking, wow, <laughs> space, a space where uh, yeah. that, that stops functioning when the code falls away. Yeah, yeah, right, okay. <laughs> I'm just wondering about goats. <laughs> now, but <laughs> cool with more goats in cities. I mean, I think, man, I, I, I generally, for me, um, it's similar to your question. Like, we, we over-program cities this is a tendency that we're seeing now we have this is a space for doing that thing and if you're not doing that thing don't go there you know you want to skate oh you will skate board here you'll do all these things i mean i think there we, we needed cities for seven thousand years were had blurred lines you know you did whatever you wanted wherever you needed to do it so i think you know i think this you're talking about man it's, it's kind of this modern city thing where we just try to control everything you know and dictate what people should do and I think cities should be much more more fluid and and, and the with blurred lines all over the place you know I don't know how you use an airport if nobody's flying that day but I mean that's, that's a great yeah. question I'm gonna probably think about that for the next week thanks very much um, but yeah absolutely great question man I love getting questions that I that uh, that I've never had before <laughs> because a lot of the questions are the same but yeah I think really man we, we should stop looking at cities as like you know divided up you know from a map you know, and, and, and just remember that people can do anything they want, or they should be able to do anything they want, wherever they want to do it. Um, I don't know why yeah. I just thought of this, but the city of Malmo in Sweden, the third largest city in Sweden, they have a declared goal of being the world's most skateboard friendly city. They literally are designing their city so that you can skateboard almost everywhere because it's social inclusion, right? It's not like they're all skateboarders, but you know, it's, it's sort of an idea like, you know, we should stop, you know, uh, setting up the barriers and break down the walls and just, you know, have a more organic city. Hopefully I answered your really cool question. <laughs> yeah, I did. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Stan. And we've got a question from Carolyn Steele who follows the, who followed you. Boss lady, how you doing? Hi, Michael. <laughs> uh, thanks for a really great talk. Um, I think we think very much alike. You know, I, I think what I'm really arguing for through food, you know, bringing people back into public space. And I, I normally talk a lot more about it, by the way, <laughs> um, about the sort of the power of the market in history to really bring people together and be the space of every man, woman, child and animal. Um, so, I mean, I guess what I was going to ask you, I mean, I think the thing that really exercises me at the moment is under lockdown, what, you know, there's, as I said in my talk, you know, there's, there's pluses and negatives to this. I mean, basically, in the UK, people have retreated into their houses, you know, and they've discovered they can order up stuff online. They never have to go out. I don't know whether you know, I mean, but a lot of our major... Uh, shops are collapsing, high streets are collapsing, there's this whole kind of question of, you know, what the future centre of the city is actually going to be for uh, if people aren't going to go in there to sort of work and to socialise anymore. So, I mean, I, I have my own thoughts about this, but I wonder what your vision was for really sort of, if you like, uh, reinventing the city centre if, if people are going to be working from home and so on. How are we going to, what recreates actually Prop, what I would call proper public life in the city, you know, which is not just somebody coming in to kind of have a cappuccino and then leave again, but actually a lot more social engagement, you know, as, as used to be the case. I mean, I showed the Agora in mm. my uh, talk, for example, you know, the Agora, as you know, was a place not to, just to go and buy food, but actually to debate, to vote. You know, people went and sort of witnessed law, law court, you know, law courts in action, and it's, so much went on there. How yeah. how can we get that kind of public engagement back? In your view, now I think you know lockdown is different everywhere. So I can only speak from Copenhagen because that's where the hell I was stuck for a year. <laughs> um, you know, and and so it was different from place to place. We didn't have any curfews or anything. Like we could walk, go out, even though all the shops were closed last year and also just recently. The bars and restaurants open today in Co uh, yesterday in Copenhagen. So why the hell am I in Leuven? Is another question. Anyway, <laughs> I'm happy to be here. <laughs> but um, everybody I knew was out drinking uh, and eating in restaurants yesterday. But I mean. I think um, for what I noticed in my neighborhood, in my city, 
city was that the only thing we had to do was to go outside. Like, you know, the shops were closed except for supermarkets and bike shops and essential services. But, you know, so people were discovering their neighborhoods. Did you know there was a park, Michael? And I'm going, there's yeah. no park there. I've lived here for 15 years. No, go. Oh, my God. Two minutes walk from my house. There's a park. I didn't even know. So I, we really have discovered parts of our cities um, that we never knew were there. I think that's going to give us a sense of ownership as citizens. You know, maybe not us who know stuff, but like just the regular citizens, you know, all the cars are coming back. Now, wait, it was nice without those cars. So hang on. We, you know, we all had a shared vision around the world of the impossible dream car free street so you know i think that it's given us a sense of ownership of uh, of a neighborhood or immediate neighborhoods where normally we would you know in copenhagen ride your bike to work and come home go to the supermarket and then we're walking around and exploring and noticing architecture i think that has been a really positive uh, effect um oh, the takeaway delivery thing oh man I'm, last year in the lockdown it started to boom and i mean people were shaming people okay i was shaming people to be honest but you know you, you, why do you order takeaway get on your own damn bike go support that <laughs> local business you mm -hmm. know and you'll they'll earn 30 percent more you know like it was just like crazy and here in Leuven, also in copenhagen like it's just there are bike delivery people everywhere for food we just kind of went oh that was really easy just to order online so that's a it's kind of like the really good things have happened and then some other things so it's a uh, as always with cities it's like yay oh no you know it's uh so we have i mean I, but i think the focus on our local environment has really being a plus and working from home you now that employers have finally realized okay those people actually do work those little worker bees that i've employed they're actually doing the job and they're doing it quicker quite a lot of the studies that i've seen so you know what then they have a better work-life balance so they can go out and go for a walk go play football do whatever so i think yeah. that's going to be a positive effect and that's going to free up a lot of office space that's going to free up you know room for apartments and, and small shops i think you know we don't know where we're going exactly but i see more positive than maybe like uh, the negative yeah that's All right. good to know thank you uh, uh carolyn for your thanks. question and uh, hang around for the next speaker thank you so much thank you very much michael colville anderson thanks